Today we're going to talk about God's plan for the church. That's right, I figured it out. I'm kidding. It's in scripture, and I think it's going to help us, but God does have a plan for his church, amen? And I think that's where we need to start, is realize that. God has a plan for his church. I'm not going to recap everything we've been through so far on this journey together, but I want to remind you that we are entering the second week of our fasting as a church, where I've challenged you to join me in choosing something that you find as a distraction, or overindulge in, or something that you'll miss as part of your routine. And it's funny, because I've talked to people, and that's one of the hardest things, is when it's part of your routine, and you disrupt that routine by moving it away, you want it back and you don't really realize why because it's just so ingrained in you. Take that away for three weeks, we're one down already, and instead spend that time in prayer. Pray to be reminded of God's provision in your life and how he has provided for our church. That's the goal, and I think that's going to help us in the future. And as we preach and teach some messages throughout, I think it's revealing things that God wants us to see about our church. So, we're going to spend some time in 1 Corinthians, and it's a letter written to the church of Corinth by Paul the Apostle. He was someone that really helped the church at the time, which was really fresh and starting out, help them understand what Jesus taught, how it connects with the theology that they would have learned through Jewish uh, study in synagogues, through the Torah and the Old Testament, and let them realize what they should be doing as a group of people. So he has great teachings that I think really help us. So let's get started in 1 Corinthians with some encouraging words from Paul. It's not our main scripture, but I love it. And it's in 1 Corinthians, uh, which is the one book that we will be reading from. It's chapter 2, verse 9. He's technically quoting Isaiah uh, 64, 4, but tomato, tomato, whatever. He says something that I think is great. He says this, these words here. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human mind has conceived the things God has prepared for those who love him. That's amazing, church. Remember, there are things God has prepared for you that you cannot even fathom or understand. And he's prepared them for you because he loves you and loves you deeply. Amen? So, where are we this morning? We talked again, little recap. Last week, we talked about fasting and God's provision. In doing so, we talked about fasting to receive God's message clearly, right? The example of Moses. We talked about fasting to secure our understanding of our own identity in Christ. And we learned that from the message of Jesus in the wilderness. And then fasting to secure a peace for God's plan. We use the example of Esther, who fasted and prayed that God would do whatever he needed to do to see his mission through, and she would be an instrument for it. Whether she lived or died, an instrument for God to be used. And that's where we rest today, is we're going to look at what God's plan is. And I think that's a great segue for us. And we're going to have three key things, because I like that. I don't know. I'll do four one day, and you're going to be like, we're going to be here till noon. Maybe. Um, the first key thing I want us to grasp today about God's plan for his church. I keep wanting to say our church because I'm excited to be here with you and do this. But it's his. It's his church. Is that the church works together. So Paul writes about the church as a body. And we're going to read that together. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read verses 12 to 26. This is where Paul talks about the body of Christ. How many have heard the church being called the body of Christ before? Right. And we're not talking about a Eucharist or anything. We're literally talking about a group of people in a church that work together. Let's read what Paul has to say in chapter 12, verse 12. Just as a body... Though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part but of many. Now, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not 
for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But, in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the hand cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body uh, that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty. While our presentable parts need no special treatment, but God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, Every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. I could stop there and we could go for an early lunch because that's amazing. Paul knew what he was doing. He really did. He's a good writer. But let me help you. Paul writes to the Corinthian church about being unified unified, right? And not fighting amongst each other or over roles of the church because that's the thing that happened with them and it happened all through history and it's probably happened here. And it may happen in the future, okay? Sorry, we're churches, we're a bunch of people, it's a thing, all right? And, you know, we'll read it again if we have to. But that's a thing, is we need to be unified and not against each other. He wants everyone to know that they are valued and that... Only when they work together can they truly see what God's plan is for that group. Only when they work together. That's it. So here at South Porcupine Pentecostal Church, I want you to know that there is no ranking of anybody. You are all valued equally. Do you believe that? We're going to enforce that. <laughs> You are valued, you are not ranked, okay? So that doesn't, it doesn't matter how much you give to the church, it doesn't matter where you volunteer or how long you've been saved, it doesn't matter if you were here in 86 when they broke ground on Legion Drive or if this is your first Sunday, you are important to the kingdom of God in this church. Got it? That's important. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you if you've made a confession of faith that Jesus Christ is alive and well and your savior. That's a big deal. That also means that the spirit of God that lives within me, that gives me the ability to do what I'm doing now, is not any more significant than the spirit of God that dwells within you. We are a team and we all have our different parts. I'm obviously the mouth <laughs> that spits. This is why I stand back here. Sorry, Chris. Um, but like, we have our giftings and we have our things, and I will get to that, but we need to remember that. Now, so you're all valued. Various individuals do lead and serve with different points of authority. I want you to understand that. The church has certain positions with directorial status, right? You saw some of them, actually. Our board members, our lead team, they came up to pray with me, with, with Allison. That's an example. So let me actually help you with a little bit of this, because if there's no ranking and there's no differences, we're all valued the same, how does it work when certain people have certain privileges or directorial status? This will help. So why and where does it come about? Well, the reason is actually stability and accountability. Because without those things, we can't function properly as a church. We need to be stable and accountable to one another. And we work to ensure that that happens in this place. So we have systems in place. We, um, here are some of those examples. And you know these probably, but hey, it helps. So pastoral leadership in the church is credentialed with the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. Pastoral leadership and the title of pastor goes to those who have that because they're under the accountable uh, 
accountability, it's what credential means, of the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada. You've probably met Pastor Jeremy Murdoch, who's the Regional Director of Northern Ontario within the Western Ontario District of all of Canada. It's fun. And uh, it means he drives a lot, really. Let's be honest. He's got a lot of mileage on his car. Um, but anyway, he would be a representative that we can connect with that helps us in times of issue crisis. He checks in to make sure we're doing the right thing. It's an accountability thing to your pastors, right? So that's why we do that. And the board or lead team can always call district and say, hey, my pastor's a wacko and we need help right? I'm accountable to people, even the lead team who works alongside to make sure that's true. So this is important. It's a really good relationship. So credentials are good because they say, hey, they believe this thing that we all believe. They're not going to lead this church astray to some other, you know, religion or cult or faith. But, you know, it's a collective to make sure that we're all on the same page and healthy. So that's why pastors here would be credentialed with the PAOC, Pentecostal Summers Canada. Uh, no one can lead or teach in the church that isn't a member. Now, that sounds weird, but here's the reason. They need to be in good standing with our practices and policies and need to adhere to what we care about and believe. If we don't know you and we don't know that you've decided to follow along with us in what we believe and care about, then to have you lead other members that have said that they believe in that would be weird. It's unbalanced, right? So we have members of the church teach and lead other members of the church right? You can still volunteer if you're not a member of the church, but in certain capacities, it makes sense that the leaders of those places would be members. Um, we give newer and irregular attendees time to get to know us and us to know them. That makes sense, right? If you're newer here, you would probably, be, actually, let's do it the other way around. If you've been here for years, let's say you were here at the breaking of ground in 86, and Someone came in very new, they were very kind and charismatic, and we decided to give them the pulpit or a Bible study time out of nowhere, and they were going to teach everybody. You would say, who's this person? I don't know them. Um, we want to get to know them first. What makes them allowed to do such a thing, right? And I think it's important that we always get to know each other, and that's why we do these things. We have like a, I believe it's a six-month waiting period, so within six months, you usually get to see either a Christmas or an Easter, how we do things and how we celebrate you get to hang out with us and we try to reach out to each other and by then depending on where you're looking to serve volunteer or connect with us opportunities have opened up and we see your skill set and your giftings and you know what's needed and it just makes sense we do it on purpose because we just want to make sure that we get along and get along well but we don't rank people based on anything we actually just have a system for all of us it works pretty well and you know we deserve to put people on a pathway, or we desire, sorry, I read it wrong. I couldn't print this morning. Save the tiniest little font. I'm figuring it out. We desire to put people on a pathway of discipleship, which means we want you to grow. Wherever you've come in, however you started your faith in Christ, we want it to go somewhere. Not to be stagnant. We don't want you to be seat warmers, pew warmers, whatever people call it these days. We actually really want you to be growing in your faith, growing in your skill set and ability, you're usable by God, and I believe that. And we can see it through. So um, we seek to have people that lead and serve according to their various spiritual gifts. And I'm going to get to that, but note, the whole idea of the body talking about, well, they're a nose, and that's awesome. I wish I was a nose, you know. Um, Paul has a weird way of writing. That's my paraphrase, I guess. But... Your special gifting of who you are actually matters, and you should really embrace that. You can still pray for other things, I'll get to that, but notice that God has really set you up for a great part of success with SPPC. We're going to keep reading. This is uh, 1 Corinthians 12. We're not going to read 17 to 31, or 27 to 31. I can read. And it says this. Now, you are the body of Christ, we're just continuing where we left off. You are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second, prophets, third, teachers, then uh, uh, second, prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of 
of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have the gift of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. So, that's the point, is that we have our gifts, we're different. But we are given it all by one Spirit of God, the same Spirit that dwells in me, dwells in you, and that makes us equal in God's eyes and usable for his kingdom and for this church. But we're going to do things a little differently, which is good. If we did it the same, it'd be a mess, right? He says, oh, if we're all one eye. But if you were all me, it'd be really loud in here, okay? <laughs> and we'd all have to wear hair nets or beard nets or something. Probably. Okay, so this is a good segue. We're going to go to spiritual gifts. So God's plan for our church is that we work together and that we all function in spiritual gifts. So here is some of that. This is now going above where you were just reading in Scripture. We read 12 on. We're going to read 4 to 11. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 4 to 11. This is what Paul writes before he gets into the speech about the body. He says, There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now, to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Common good, church. For the common good. It's for all of us. That gift you have. It's for everyone here. Okay, verse 8. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts uh, or another prophecy. Um, gifts of healing, sorry, to one, one Spirit. And another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, uh, distinguishing between spirits. And to another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these, this is verse 11, are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So the first and foremost rule, I know I'm hitting uh, you know, this again, but it's that it's one Spirit. And Paul really wanted us to know that. That with this one spirit, we are all gifted. And the other is that God's plan for the church is to acknowledge in that same spirit that there are many different things that we can utilize. So that same spirit resides in your pastor. That's me. Resides in the worship team, the tech team, the greeters, custodian, uh, board members, or lead team, uh, kids and youth, as well as kids and youth workers. Amen. Um, prayer team members, etc. You get the idea. The point is, is that the same spirit dwells in everyone in this room if you make the confession of faith that Jesus Christ is alive and well and your Savior. But he's not different within you. When you see someone pray and something miraculous happen, you can pray that God does that through you too. You can. And he can. So beyond that message of a unifying one spirit, there's a message of individual gifts making us a special team. This church has many people in it with many different gifts. I'm excited about that. And you might not know what your gift is, right? My gifts are uh, wisdom, discernment, leadership, and administration. Those are things that God has given me as giftings, and sometimes I'm great at it, sometimes I'm not. It doesn't mean that I'm solely great at this one thing and I only have wisdom mode. I've said dumb things. Like, really, I have, okay? And I will again. That's how it works. But spiritually speaking, God can do that in me and give me words of wisdom in times that I didn't expect him to be able to do so. It's yielding to his work in your life, right? So I may lead poorly. I also may lead well, depending on if I'm really surrendering myself to the gift that he's placed inside of me and if I've nourished it and allowed it to grow. Right now, I got sourdough bread being fed and grown on my countertop because Jess is really into that right now, and my whole house smells like yeast or something. Um, but it's a good analogy of feeding something to see it grow, and I think that we need to, like sourdough bread in a jar in a kitchen, feed our spirit and allow it to grow. Amen? Good analogy. Jess will be proud. Um, or super mad. See, I say dumb things. I say dumb things. Anyway, it doesn't matter. 
Um, you may have a gift of hospitality, mercy, pastoral care, or something else. Dig into it. Let him build it within you. Feed it and let it grow. Uh, this church succeeds when we actually are using them. We don't succeed if we're not using them. You have an ailment in your body where your, uh, maybe your hip hurts a lot and you have a limp. You're not succeeding in your mind as the world would want you to succeed with that limp. You can't run. You're not saying bolt. You can't do certain things you wish you could do, right? But that's like a body of Christ where someone with a good gifting within God's mighty power is not being used. It's a church with a limp. And God wants that to be a healthy, working body. And I think that it's just so great to read these analogies of what he's writing out and understand that in order to be successful, we have to work together according to the gifts that are within us. And we can't be jealous about the gifts that someone else has that you don't have. And we need to remember that when someone is hurting in our church that we mourn together. You ever stub your toe? You don't just say, well, that toe hurts. No, you do this. And then your whole body contorts and you start saying things. Maybe they're words of wisdom. I don't know. But you say things and you're in pain. Right? Because your whole body is affected by one part that hurts. Right? And when you're excited, you, you do something about it. When you're overjoyed, sometimes you jump. Sometimes you say great things. Sometimes there's just, you can't keep it in. Right? Maybe you have a happy dance. You do not need to demonstrate that for me today. And neither do I for you. But that's rejoicing together. So don't forget that these individual parts have a unifying property. We're together in this. So, okay, we talked about the body. We talked about the spiritual gifts. This is great. So now I need us to understand that what do we do with it all, right? If we're supposed to run as a healthy person, no limp. If we're supposed to work together, rejoice together, and have pain together, where are we going, what is the point of it all? A teamwork for what means? To what end? This is our final point, and it is the mandate of the church. And Jesus helps us understand that because we need to know. And I think a lot of the times we can get confused and we can get focused on pieces that aren't the core mandate, but we can utilize them in a means of sharing what the core point is. Look at this. What does God say is the reason that we meet together in the first place? Is it to worship him? Is it to learn from scripture? Is it to pray? Is it to provide for people in need? Is it to rest and have fellowship together as friends and families? Note that I listed everything amazing about churches. Because they're good things. And shouldn't be forgotten or left by the side. And though that these are good things. And they come from the mandate that God has given the church. They aren't the mandate of the church. Because Jesus declares in Matthew 16, 13 to 18, when talking to his people, he starts with this. And I think this is the first basis that we want to begin from. Jesus speaks to his disciples. He says, Jesus, when coming to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do you say the son of man is? And they replied, um, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven and I tell you that you are Peter. He renames him Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. So he speaks to Peter. He names him Peter. His name was Simon before. But Peter means rock, foundation, solid. And he renames him because of what he has said. Peter made a lot of mistakes. So it's not because of what he did, right? It's because of what he said. And that truth of Jesus Christ, not just a, a man who was really good at political stuff. He had good um, you know, ways to manipulate people with his words or he was overly generous, kind. No, it's that he was truly the son of the living God. God incarnate, the Messiah that the Jewish people have been waiting for through prophecies dating back many, many hundreds of years prior. 
That is special and even foretold, by the way, in Genesis, which is phenomenal. There's something about that statement that says Jesus was not just a man, but he was God Almighty in flesh. That is where he based his church. That was the foundation in the rock that he based his church. So this church, thousands of years later, is based on that truth and that truth alone. That's where we start. And if that's not something we believe, we're in a really messy place, right? So that's why I keep talking about this Jesus guy, because honestly, that's the point. And there's no other point but him. It's why we're together. It's why we have spiritual gifts. It's why we want to be unified and be a team with people that we may or may not like, but God has called us to love. Don't look at anyone, <laughs> right? But that's the thing. That's good, isn't it? To be a family of differences, of different values a bit, but connected with the same goal of what Christ is doing. And we do unify our values as we connect and work together as a team. This is good. So that's our foundation. So if Jesus is the point, what was Jesus' mission? What was he all about? Because if he's the foundation and he's the reason we're here, then we need to know what he was doing. And Jesus had a pretty clear goal. Jesus taught everyone about what it means to be in a relationship with their creator, God Almighty. And, but they knew that they were unholy and sinful. Unable to have that true connection and relationship with God. Not like Jesus did. So Jesus then did something very special. He showed us how to live. He provided the way to that relationship because he died on the cross. He was the sacrifice that the Jewish people would have did sacrifices all the time. They would have had lambs that were innocently slain and brought before God Almighty in the temple, at the altar. But he died on Passover, the Passover lamb that they would have done for the sins of their people. He died to represent that we now have freedom in him. Freedom to have a relationship with our creator, God Almighty. Freedom to walk in his blessings that he clearly writes about all through scripture for us. Freedom to be what he wants us to be as a church body. That's beautiful and wonderful because he has blessings beyond, as we started this service with, beyond what you can fathom or imagine, prepared for you. So that is what he did, but his mission didn't stop there because he proved it. He rose again three days later, showing that he is beyond just a sacrificing God, but alive and well God who's conquered sin and death, and now we have a future. We're not just forgive and move on. We have a future, and therefore we have a mandate, the thing that we're looking at. When he spoke to them before ascending to heaven, he said in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, he says, it says that Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and in the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The mission of Jesus Christ was to make disciples. And I know that that can be an odd thing to say, so I want to unpack it a little bit as we close this off. Here's the thing, church. We're supposed to, first and foremost, be people that bring the message I just shared of what Jesus did on the cross, conquering sin and death, to everyone we meet. People don't know the truth of what God, the creator of all of this, has done. I know I'm pointing to snow. I'm aware. So God created all of this beautiful world, even if it's a snow globe for half the year or eight months or whatever it is in South Park. Um, but God has shown us great joy in that revelation that this world was created for us to rejoice over, over him who blesses us over him who's gifted it to us. And when people are struggling out there and they don't know the truth and they are fighting to understand who they are or what's happening in a broken, messed up world, we can share truth with them that has a grace message of love and help them see where they're called to go because we have that ability through scripture, amen? That's the thing that we need to remember is our mandate. Point people to Christ so that they would be saved in a lost world. And then disciple them. Disciple means student of, to teach them. Let them learn and grow. Show them what they can do with God's ability. 
I talked about spiritual gifts today. Maybe you're thinking, I don't know what mine is. That sounds fun. I would like one. I understand that. We're here to teach you that. We're here to talk about that and to see it grow within you. Not to leave you to figure that out for yourself. That's discipling. That's teaching you as a student of God's word what your role is. We already know your purpose. Go save the lost in a broken world. But now you know what your calling and purpose can become with the skills and tools you have available to you. We teach that to you. So we're supposed to go save and then disciple and those people then go save and then disciple and they save and disciple and so on and so on. And I'm still not on camera for nursery. We haven't stopped yet. I'm still here. So that's important is that we do that and it goes on and on and it's so wonderful. But when we get distracted by other things, maybe it's infighting, maybe it's my gift is better than that gift or I can't do this or I want to do that. We're going to lose the reason we're here and I don't want us to. So we get a good foundation, Jesus Christ, son of God, right? And then we get a good mandate to understand that we're going to save and disciple, and save and disciple, and continue that forward. Then we're really setting ourselves up for success. You do it with the gifts you have, and you do it together. Together through it all, amen? That's the point, and that's what I want us to see today, is that we're a people excited for where we're going to go because of what God's placed on our lives. He's been doing this for years, longer than you've been here, longer than I've been here. He was here before the shovel hit the dirt, in the ground, here at this church, uh, in this land. He was here on the streets in the other two places prior. He's been working through Timmins. He's working through other places where you can see it. And it's like, wow, I did not know that God was doing this great miracle here or there it's his land, it's his word, it's his thing, and it's going forward, with or without you, really, but he wants it to be with you. He wants you to lead it, because he's given you his spirit to go forward, amen? We're going to do that together. So today, church, if you want to know what God's plan is for his church, for us, it is truly to work together, to serve according to his God-given gifts, and to save the lost and make disciples. It's simply those things, and we can do it together. Stand and let's pray. We're going to do it for his glory. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord God, today I pray that you are speaking to each individual in the room louder than me. I know it's crazy, but you can do that. And I pray that you start to allow that small voice within their hearts, within their spirit, you, Lord God, to start showing what the gifts are that each and every one of us has and how it can be used to edify, contribute to, and build up the body of Christ. Because we can't do it alone, and we're not supposed to. For those struggling to understand what that looks like. I want to be like them. I want that gifting. I want that role or that title or whatever it may be. I pray that you start to work in that heart to have value for the precious gift you've given them. And not to worry or covet or seek gifts or other things that are around. Because you need everyone to do it well and all of us to do our work as a team. God, you've called us all to something special, and I'm so thankful for that. A unified body moving forward. Never let us lose sight of our goal, because ultimately together we are all capable and called to win the lost, share your truth, that they would come to know you as their Savior, and to teach and disciple. We guide people together because you've done it to us first. Thank you, Lord, for that special gift that we freely give others. We do it because of you and your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.